with new mysteries being uncovered every day, there are countless unsolved mysteries that most people have never heard of. They might not get the same attention as some of the bigger mysteries, but remain just as puzzling and unsettling. Number 5 Around the world, there are stories of ape-like creatures that remain elusive. In the Caucasus region of Europe and Asia, they're referred to as the Almasti or Almasti, and one of them may have been captured in the 1800s. The female had been spotted in a remote area of what is today Georgia in the 1870s. For generations, folklore said that there were a group of wild people who lived in the mountains, and this woman appeared to be one of them. A merchant set out to capture the woman and managed to do so. The woman was given the name Zana and became an attraction. According to those who saw her, she looked somewhere between a human and an ape. She was six foot six inches tall and had auburn hair all over her body. The hair on her head was slightly longer. Her facial features were also strange to the villagers. What was most bewildering were the feats she was supposedly able to achieve. She could run faster than a galloping horse and swim against the tide in a nearby river. Zena was treated like an animal. At first, she was kept outside in a cage and dug a hole in the ground to sleep in. Over time, the cage turned into a larger enclosure until she was finally free to go where she wanted, though she always returned back to the merchant and her source of food. She taught basic chores like how to grind corn and sold them to a nobleman named Eji Janaba. She couldn't be taught to speak, but did come to understand instructions from Janaba and others. Zena apparently didn't like to stay inside, even when given the option of a warm room. She also wouldn't wear clothing, instead ripping up the dresses she was given. She did have six children, with four surviving to adulthood and living apparently ordinary lives. The children didn't have the same body hair as their mother, but were exceptionally strong. They also had children, which shouldn't have been possible if Zena was something other than human. Where Zena originated and what she truly was remains a mystery. DNA tests on her descendants suggest that she had 100% sub-Saharan African DNA. It's possible she was an escaped slave, with her abilities exaggerated by locals who would be unfamiliar with people from Africa. But further tests couldn't narrow down where her family would have originated. It's possible her ancestors left Africa far before humans did and had been living in the remote regions undisturbed by humans for thousands of years. Beside the anecdotes of Zana's incredible feats, there's some evidence that this may have been the case. The remains of Zana's son were also excavated and it was discovered that his skull had a bone that was not normal for humans. His eye sockets were also exceptionally large. It would have been impossible for humans to have survived living outside in the frigid conditions that Xana survived. This strange, unexplained mystery continues to excite those that believe in the wild people, while skeptics remain unconvinced. Number 4 A stretch of mountains and woodland in Slovakia earned the nickname the Trebek Triangle due to the number of mysterious occurrences and disappearances that have taken place in the area. According to legend, locals have always believed in a mystical presence in the mountains. Some sources say strange lights are among the mysterious phenomena that have been witnessed. But the most famous are the disappearances, which have taken place since at least the early 20th century. The earliest recorded disappearance was that of 40-year-old Stefan Semsali in 1929. Stefan was a forester from the village just south of the Triangle. It was a day in late November when he left to head into the forest. At the time, Stefan rented a room from a couple. When he didn't return home the first night, they weren't too alarmed. It was only after three days had passed that they began searching for Stefan. The weather was extremely harsh and the search was called off after a few days. But even when the snow had melted, there was no sign of Stefan in the forest. Stefan wouldn't be the last person to disappear in the mountains. The following year, an 18-year-old girl disappeared in the same area. But the most mysterious missing person case from the Trebek Triangle was that of Walter Fisher. Walter was a factory worker. During the week, he lived in the town that had popped up around the factory. But on Sundays, he would travel to visit his wife and son who lived in the Trebek Triangle. On January 24, 1939, 
something strange happened. While on the visit, he went for a walk in the mountains and never returned. Assuming he must have gone straight back to the factory village, his wife asked Walter's brother to check in on him. He discovered that Walter had been missing from work for a few days and was no longer employed. Walter was reported missing, but it was his friends who had to conduct the search for him. For months, there was no sign of Walter. But on May 8th, Walter suddenly reappeared. He was found 35 kilometers away and had strange burns on his body. He was also mentally scarred by whatever had happened to him and spent the rest of his life in a mental institution. Whether there's anything strange going on in the mountains of Western Slovakia is unclear. Some claim the stories are all hoaxes, while others point to gold mines in the area, which may explain some disappearances. The truth remains a strange mystery. Number 3 Hollywood has far more unsolved mysteries than the film industry would like to present to the public. One of the strangest is what happened to screenwriter Gary DeVore. Gary vanished without a trace in June of 1997. A year later, his car was found in the California aqueduct with his body still behind the wheel. But that wasn't the end of the mystery. Gary was a successful screenwriter along with the likes of Arnold Schwarzenegger. In 1997, he was preparing to make his directorial debut with a film called The Big Steel. It was a film he also had written the script for. The film claimed to reveal the true reason for the US invasion of Panama to steal material that was being used to blackmail members of the US government. Gary had been working on the script but hit writer's block. He traveled to Santa Fe to work with collaborator Marsha Mason on June 27, 1995. That evening, he finally completed the finished draft. He began the drive back through the desert to his home in Santa Barbara. During the journey, he called his wife a few times. The final call took place at 1.15 a.m. He told his wife he was four hours away and was thinking about staying the night at a motel so that he could polish the script some more. She told him to come back as they were planning a party for the following day. Gary never made it home. His disappearance made headlines and the search was very high profile. Investigators searched the route that Gary would have taken to return home. A search of the aqueduct also took place. Nothing was found that could explain what had happened. On July 8, 1998, an amateur detective named Douglas Crawford called in a tip. He said he had a hunch that the car was in the aqueduct. It was searched again. This time, Gary's car was found. His body was in the driver's seat, indicating a tragic accident had taken place. But there were a number of aspects that didn't make sense. For Gary to end up in the position that he was in, he would have had to have driven the wrong way on the highway for several miles. He would have done this with the lights off. Despite the fact that the road was not lit by street lights, the car was found with the switch for the headlights in the off position. Gary also had his seatbelt on in the car, which was not the norm for him, and he had his wallet in his back pocket. Gary was an ex-truck driver and this apparently was also strange for him. The strangest thing was that Gary's hands and laptop were both missing. Three hand bones were allegedly found in the vehicle, but these were determined to have been hundreds of years old. Conspiracy theories surround this case. The most common theory is that Gary had been taken out due to secrets that he would reveal in his script. Earlier versions of the Big Steel still exist, and some lines have made it into the press. A documentary investigating the case has been released, but the truth may never be known. Number 2 the disappearance of Commander Lionel Crabbe is a strange spy story that has inspired the likes of Ian Fleming and countless conspiracy theorists. It's an unsolved mystery that likely won't be answered in the near future. Crabbe was a war hero, having learned to dive during the Second World War in order to defuse mines that were attached to the sides of British ships. He was not the fittest of men, but he was audacious and adaptable. After the war, he had taken on commercial diving jobs but at some point had come into contact with MI6. In April of 1956, British spies were presented with an opportunity that they couldn't miss. The Soviet leader and his defense minister came to the UK on a goodwill visit. They arrived on another cruiser. The British prime minister had sent orders to MI6 that there would be no spying on the Soviets during their trip. 
Conveniently, those high up at MI6 didn't see this note until it was too late. The plan was for Crab to dive beneath the cruiser and take photos of its underside. At 6 a.m. on April 19, 1956, he and an American handler went to the docks where they met up with Lieutenant Commander George Franklin and Chief Detective Superintendent Lampert. Franklin was to assist Crab on the dive. Crab and Franklin headed out on a small vessel until they were within swimming distance of the cruiser. Just before 7 a.m., Crab hit the water with about two hours of oxygen in the tank. 20 minutes into the mission, he surfaced and told Franklin it was too cold and dark. He asked for extra ballast, then went back under the surface. When the two hours were up, there was no sign of Crab. Franklin returned to the shore, thinking he might have gone back for some reason. He quickly realized Crab was missing. Those working on the mission tried to keep Crab's disappearance a secret. Unfortunately for them, three men aboard the cruiser had spotted the diver near the ship. The commander had spoken to his British counterpart about the strange diver who appeared to be spying on them. The story hit the press a few days later. Both the British and Soviet governments were extremely angry about the spying, but no explanation for Crab's disappearance could be found. It seemed that he had simply had an accident beneath the water. That was until June of 1957, when a fisherman pulled up human remains in a diving suit similar to the one that Crab had been wearing. The man's head and hands were missing. Crab's family would not confirm that this was their missing loved one, but the body was deemed to be Crab. This only left more questions unanswered. Theories ranged from the Soviets taking Crab's life when he was discovered that cold April morning to Crab defecting to the British spy agency wanting to get rid of him. The files in this case will remain classified until 2057, 70 years longer than standard declassification rules. Only then is it likely that any answers will be uncovered. Number 1 The White Star Line was made famous by the sinking of the Titanic. But years before that tragedy, there was another much more mysterious event that's rarely talked about. It remains unsolved to this day. Despite being owned by the same company, the SS Neuronic was nothing like the Titanic. While most White Star Line ships were large and fast, the Neuronic was a smaller ship designed to ship cattle from the UK to the US. There was a small amount of space for passengers, but most of the people aboard would either be sailors or cattlemen. For several months, the Neuronic made the journey between Liverpool and New York without issue. That good run would come to an end in February of 1893. The Neuronic left Liverpool on February 11th with 74 men on board. 50 were crew members, with the other 24 being mostly cattlemen. There were a few people who had simply paid for passage to New York. The ship first made the small trip to Wales, where she dropped off her pilot, then set sail for the Atlantic. The ship would never make it to New York. It should have been 10 days for the Neuronic to make the trip, but it wasn't uncommon for bad weather to extend journeys. Several weeks passed before the people started to question what had happened. In an age before wireless telegraph, there was no way of knowing what had happened until the ship didn't turn up. At the start of March, the White Star Line officially still believed the ship was fine. But on March 3rd, a bottle washed up in Bay Ridge, New York. Inside was a hastily scribbled note it read February 19, 1893, Neuronic sinking, all hands praying, God have mercy on us. It was signed by L. Wenzel. There was no L. Wenzel on the ship, but there was a John L. Watson. It's possible bad handwriting and water smudging the writing may have led to the name being misread. The following day, the SS Coventry spotted two lifeboats from the Neuronic. One was capsized and the other was sunk. This wasn't made public until March 16th. No other trace of the ship has ever been found, but three more messages and bottles were discovered in Virginia, Ireland, and Liverpool. The notes revealed that the ship had hit an iceberg and there was no hope of surviving an Arctic storm. None of the notes were signed by anyone known to be on the ship, but there were icebergs in the area that the Neuronic would have sailed through. Many believe the notes to be hoaxes, but we know today that an iceberg definitely could have been responsible for the sinking ship. The wreck of the Neuronic has never been found, making it the White Star Line's unexplained disappearance. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.